More Than Fitness family. Thank you again for tuning in to another episode. Uh, I, I want to genuinely thank you for your continued interest um, and curiosity about the individuals that I'm having on the show. Feel free to please reach out to me at Adrian Conway underscore. If you have athletes that you feel like should be promoted more, that you feel like I should have on, that you'd like to know more, or you think would just be a really good sit down interview. Another reminder is to please share our podcast with others as we want to continue to grow our sport, grow the education surrounding our sport, and talk about the nuances and the things involved in the athletes' lives so that they can continue to grow their brands as this will continue to push our sport to a more professional platform and level. Nonetheless, today I have got on Dallin Pepper. If you guys don't know Dallin, he's been around our space for quite a while. He found his way to the CrossFit Games for the first time in 2017, and he was a not one, not two, but three times CrossFit Games champion as a teen athlete. And he's been one of the rarities that has found great success in the transition from a teen athlete with a bit of some growth period in between. He personally experienced COVID and the natural odd setback that that created for many of us um, within his competitive career in that window. And then he would go on to punch his first ticket as an individual last year in 2022. He had aspirations of finishing top 10, which he didn't. And we'll get into a little bit of that within our interview. But then this season, Dallin Pepper has put on a, a very good display of fitness and progress. He finished eighth in the open worldwide. He finished first in the quarterfinals in North America East. He finished third in the quarterfinals worldwide. And of course, he would go on to finish North America East um, the first week of semifinals, third on the podium with an extremely, extremely stacked field. Um, We get to know Dallin a little bit about his personal life. We talk about the competitive nature uh, that he's always had as an athlete. We talk about his development within the space, being down in Naples, Florida with the Brute team, uh, his coach, Matt Torres, which he's been with since 2016. And the, of course, progress and the forward display of what it'll be like for him to train for the 2023 CrossFit Games in these next seven to eight weeks. So folks, you're going to love this interview. Um, Give Dallin Pepper a follow on Instagram. He said that's probably the best place to follow along his journey. And most importantly, enjoy this episode. Thanks for tuning in. Ladies and gentlemen, today I am joined by Dallin Pepper, who just recently finished third at North America East. And you got yourself on the podium, my man. How are you feeling about your most recent competition out there in Orlando? I'm stoked. I mean, it was a blast. Uh, it's always, I mean, we have a great group of guys like all across the world, but I feel like uh, there's a lot of dudes in the East that I'm pretty close with. So uh, just getting to throw down with them at what I like to call a mini CrossFit Games. It's, I mean, there's how many top 10 dudes in that region? Uh, and like some serious tests that I think will show up similarly at the games. And so like, no complaints here. It was a blast. I believe it, man. I'm sure it was a great time. I had a great time being down there. Of course, I got to cover it predominantly on the team side, but I was there to kind of watch the the spectacle play out between the individuals. Um, man, your execution that weekend, I got to say, seemed to be like some of the most cool, calm, and collected execution I'd seen on the individual side in quite a while, to be honest, right? And I say that in comparison. I've been around the sport for a long time, and I watch – Uh, Not just the way people execute and compete, but the way they carry themselves and the way they kind of go and navigate a a test to test, um, deal with the ups and the downs. And you really didn't have a lot of ups and downs, man. You were very even keeled. In fact, I think throughout the three weeks, and I could be wrong because I I wasn't as familiar with Oceania and Europe uh, because I wasn't involved in those semis Mm -hmm. as much. But I think you might have been the only guy that went top 10, like under top 10 in every every test as it played out. Um how did you feel about your ability to kind of seize the moment and execute? Was that, was that ex- actually, you know, one of your primary goals and focuses going into that weekend? Yeah. I mean, so going back to like West coast classic two years ago, the first semi yep. I was at, I was yeah, up and down back. all over the leaderboard. I was had like a couple second place finishes, multiple top fives, and then stuff outside the top 20 or like low twenties out of a field of 30. Um, I believe could be wrong on that, but, uh, I just, it didn't, it wasn't enough. And so one of the big goals, like is just slowly becoming more and more consistent and bringing what's my weaknesses up to my strengths and then continuing to improve strengths, obviously. Um, and yeah. And then the other side of that was the number one goal of the weekend was just clean runs uh, as much as possible. And there are definitely some things that stick out that I feel like I did a good job, maybe, 
not hiding from my competitors or outside eyes, but there was definitely some hiccups throughout workouts, but just trying to bounce back smoothly and cleanly through the rest of the workout. And I think that worked well. Yeah. And I think that's a, that's a key focus of it, right? Like as an, as an athlete and you experience this already in, in, in many degrees, but the ups and the downs, they're going to come and it's kind of how you, how you shake them off and kind of roll them off your shoulder and then focus on what's next. Um, you've got some pretty solid momentum building through 2023. Here's what I'll say. I think you were, was it eighth in the open this year overall in the world? Mm -hmm. Um, I believe some, somewhere in that, in that window, definitely top 10. Um, you were first in North America East in the quarters, third in the world in the quarterfinals. Um, the, the way the season has played out, in your mind as you prep for it, man, are you focused on your placing? Or are you focused more, as you mentioned earlier, on like the execution of each test and or event? Yeah, I feel like this year um, I've really shut out outside noise. I used to be I mean, as a fan of the sport and growing up as a team in the sport, I was following every move of the individuals because I love I love it. Uh, and now that I've kind of made that transition, I've realized I need to step away from that side of things and focus on all the decisions I'm making throughout my day because I am with the individuals and I am the like at the top with all these guys and I have to focus on that. So I've kind of, like I said, block some of that noise out and I am focused on my placing. I mean, that's what, at the end of the day, like that's how you secure sponsorships. That's how I'm making a living, all of these things. And I think placings do have a place when you're setting goals, but then in the day to day, not focusing on that and more focusing on decisions and execution uh, in everything. Yeah. And it's, it's funny because I think there's beauty in that, um, which kind of takes time to learn. Right. Because if, if we're looking at traditional sports, we we want to we want to butt our chest up against our competition. That's 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 the fun part mm -hmm. of it. Right. And, and, and the football player in me and I'm sure this kind of carries over for you as well as growing up playing different sports. It's like um, it, it's our nature to, to compare and we want to kind of feel that head to head type experience when we when we talk about competing. But in our sport, there's so much out of our control. And I'm sure that you've navigated and learned this throughout the years, but it's you've clearly started to refine your ability to focus solely on you. Um, can you talk a little bit about what it's been like to manage your expectations, right? Whether it's, hey, I'm, I'm shooting for the podium or, hey, I want to get first place. Um, when we consider things like the test is always different. And of course, the field and their skill sets are actually always evolving as well. How, how do you manage that personally? Yeah, like I think a good example would be the games last year. My goal was top 10. I did not make that goal. I was 19. Um, and as things shift and as things don't go your way, things are outside of your control. Uh, you have to really start to focus in on your execution and every, like I said before, like all the little things. So it's how am I going to approach this to get the best score for me? Um, where in some events you're able to game it and you're, you're racing the field. Uh, so knowing when to race the field and knowing when you got to run your game plan. And I think that's a huge part in controlling what you can control, uh, not getting caught up in races that you have no control over. Yeah. And you're, I mean, a lot of people know this about you already, but you're, you're in Naples, Florida, mm -hmm. right? Like you, you live down there. You're under the tutelage of Matt Torres and the, and the brute crew, the brute squad. Um, what are those conversations like, Dallin, even at the CrossFit Games last year, right? Like you show up, you're like, hey, I'm, I'm here. I want to establish myself as a, as a top 10 athlete. Um, things aren't going perhaps the way that I dreamed them to go or how I wanted them to go. And you're in the thick of it, though. You know, you're two days into a four-day competition or however it was when you started to realize, like, okay, my, my expectations got to pivot and change a little bit. What are those conversations like in the back with your coach, with your team, even with your family? Yeah, I think, I mean, I have an awesome team. Uh, with everyone, we got like a big Airbnb last year. So when we were coming home from events, even if it didn't go well, we tried to keep things light, try and laugh. Uh, cause you got to get your head cleared, go to bed, show up again the next day. Something Matt always talks to us about in training and especially going into competition when we're prepping and doing more workouts that are for time and like, uh, sport specific style events. Uh, he's always talking about 
how can we get the best score possible for me or for whatever athlete he's talking to. And I think that's one thing we do really well and probably a little different is we're not afraid to really analyze a workout and see this is where this is what's going to slow me down. So I'm going to break it up or pace it way more than anyone else might would might do. And then we're going to push in other areas. And if you watch some of us do workouts, if you start paying attention to some of those things, we'll definitely do things a little out of the ordinary to set us up for our best score. And there's no point in trying to do a rep scheme that someone else is doing when they can do twice as many chest of bar pull-ups as you like, there's no point. Um, and I think that was a big conversation that we're having as we're, that's the focus throughout the rest of the weekend when things kind of start to not go my way. And then this was a really cool conversation. I know there's a video somewhere cause there's videographers in the room when Matt was giving us like our pre semis talk right before registration is all about how we carry ourselves and all of that. And the big thing that stood out through semis I think everyone could agree on this was Matt really emphasized that we, we as athletes have all the tools we need to do. We don't need to be heroes. We don't need to go out and do anything special. You just need to execute your game plan. And at the end of the day, you're going to be right where you need to be. Man, that's, that's, that's wisdom of all wisdom right there being, being handed down to you. And I think it's important to remind almost every athlete, you know, it it sounds super cliche, Mm -hmm. uh, but it's like, you are enough. Right. And if and if you actually don't go into a competition believing that you are enough and what you've worked towards is enough, then you are the athlete that's guess what? You're dropping back and you're trying to throw the Hail Mary every time. Mm -hmm. And you're like, whoa, whoa, whoa. It was first and ten, bro. We got (laughs) plenty of time and downs to gain yards here and nickel and dime down the field. And we can do this in a very controlled way, the way that we know how. It's funny because I think that even as an athlete, you've competed in the space for so so long. I'm sure I'm sure you tried to throw some Hail Marys in your day. Absolutely. Um are there any of those that stand out to you where you're like, you know, I got some lessons and uh, they weren't always coming the easy way. Is there anything like that that pops out to you? Yeah. So this year at Wadapalooza, I actually purposely wanted to find an event to do that. It's Wadapalooza, um, off-season competition. Yep. So there was, a, there was a chipper, I believe it had like legless rope climb, weighted GHD, some sort of like kettlebell movements down with a run kettlebell movements, regular GHD, regular rope climb coming back. And I knew that was a really good workout for me. So I was like, we're going to go for it. Um, got in a race with another athlete and things were tight. He set the kettlebells down. I was like, I'm going to do five more reps, try and get in his head. Um, we're in it now. Let's go for it. We're going to yep. send these GHDs. I know I can do rope climbs in my sleep. Um, and it took me like two and a half minutes to do like six rope climbs. So I could do six rope climbs in a minute, like any day of the week, just completely yep. blew up. Um, and the reason that that workout stands out to me is as I was coming off the floor, Vellner was coming onto the floor and not directly to him. I don't think I was talking to anyone. I was like, well, I went for it and it didn't work. Just like out loud thinking. Um, and he brought it up to me like later that night and Pat's just a good dude. So we had a pretty good laugh about that. And that's why I- like that instance stands out to me, but it happens. It happens. You know, and it, and it does happen. And there's such a big difference, though. Um, and even what you're bringing up right now, it's like people listening to this talk or listening to this interview or perhaps watching it. Um, they're fans of the sport already, right? Like they're they're curious about who you are. They want to know more, or they they just really love to geek out and nerd on athletes, coaches, and everybody in the space. But what a lot of people don't realize, I don't think still at this point, as we're still working on teaching our fans how to fan out about what we do, um, I don't know if they know that there's games within the game. And oh. when you when you mention Vellner, I, I think he, he's one that, that can be pretty notorious for this, where, hey, he, he got, you know, some type of movement in his back pocket where he's like, I'm really good at this. I know some of these other guys aren't so good at this, so they're a little stressed about it. I'm going to go extra fast here and see mm-hmm. what they got in their bag, and I'm still not even showing all my hands yet of this deck, right? Like, so he's he's almost in his in his mind playing with house money and kind of drawing out the field. Um, when you describe what you were just did when you try to throw that hail mary, that's almost like what you were doing is you were basically navigating and not just trying to set someone else for failure, but you were also learning about where your thresholds are in a particular movement or a particular type of test. And so the conversation that I, that I kind of want to have on this point before we move on is that there's a ton of worth. You said, Hey, it's Wadapalooza. 
you know, um, it's, it's not like there's not a lot on the line for me. I need to use this as a learning experience. How often are you doing that in your own mind, right? Where it's like, hey, I know to optimize my performance, this is what I need to do. But instead, I'm going to do this in case maybe one day I have to do this or maybe I'll really learn something else. What's the balance like in your training or in your competing with that? Yeah, in training, that's like an everyday kind of thing. Um, when you're looking at workouts, I find it easiest to choose one very specific thing to focus on. It's like mm. you have to do this set of muscle-ups unbroken every single round um, or every interval. Uh, and nothing, nothing else really matters in the workout. Like if you are standing, standing there looking at the bar for however long, if that's the intent of the workout, then that's what we're going to focus on. Cause one day, I don't know, boss could throw out, you have to do muscle ups unbroken. Like we've, we've seen other movements like that. Um, that's right. That's not something Matt and I, before every single piece, like what is the intent of this? And like, do I need to do this unbroken? Do I need to do fast quick sets? Maybe that's something I need to practice. Um, so it's, it's an everyday thing. For sure. I love it, man. And, and, I, and I think that makes that makes complete sense to me. And it's clearly something that I've communicated to athletes throughout the years is that, um, you know, in training, it's safe. Right. It's, it's a safe place. And we got to be risky and we got to take risks. We got to learn where our red line really is and learn how to operate there. Uh, because there's going to be times where we're forced to, um, and then there's going to be times that are very different. And I got to say, you know, it seems as though, um, what you guys are doing down there in Naples is really working in your favor because it seemed as though execution wise, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, but it seems like a lot of the tests that I watched from this weekend, and that has nothing to do with what the games will look like or what it's looked like in the past, but it seemed like you were able to navigate almost at a percentile mm -hmm. of your fitness and what you've built versus a lot of the field in order to have success or in order to qualify to the CrossFit games, or especially in order to get into the podium, man, which, which you did, um, they're having to operate outside of their, you know, they are having to throw a few Hail Marys. They're having to operate outside of their 95 to 90 to 95 percentile of fitness. So there's a little bit more suffering going on for those guys. They're a little bit more outside of their head in regards to, uh, you know, clarity and focus, but you seemed very focused and actually able to operate at that percentile, um, that seems more manageable. Let's, let's call it like 80 to 90 instead of 90 to hundred um, percent. Is that something that you're conscious of? Like when it comes to pacing, uh, I, I need to build such a capacity that I can, I can operate here while the other guys are trying to operate up here. Is that something that you're mindful of? Yeah, I guess it's not like fully on purpose all the time. Um, it more comes down to limiters such as like, like Linda, every, if you watch a lot of Palooza, I really struggled on the bench press. I did fine. Like yeah. I did great on Linda. I was really stoked. Um, but I was operating at like an 80 to 90% fitness capacity, being aware of what the bench press could do. And now next time I'll sure. be able to operate probably like 90 to 95. Um, I don't think you're, in my opinion, I don't think you're fully going to just stick in that 80 to 90% until you're standing on top of that podium every single time, like Frazier, for example, or Froning. Um, yep. If you really watch them, you can, you can see they're just, gaming every single workout almost every single time um and just trying to leave a little bit in the tank for the next workout that type of thing um so there are times where i am aware of it but it's it's not necessarily me holding anything back i want to make sure i'm giving everything each event but a uh, weakness or limiter could bring that capacity down a little bit yeah and and i and i know i know it's one of those things i mean because i've been there I've experienced most, most of the tests that I've experienced at the regional floor uh, at the time when I was competing individual, like I got to be there. I was the 90 to hundred percent guy. Like my fitness was there, but I'd get a few tests where it would be like, Oh, I'm in this 80 to 90% window and I'm looking around and I feel good and I can see they ain't feeling so good, you know, and, and it would build confidence in me. Um, and then understanding to those of you that are listening to this as we're having this conversation of games within the game is that, you know, the more broad you can make your aerobic capacity and the more infinite you can make, I mean, and I know everybody's going to have their limiters, but the more infinite that you can make local muscle endurance, uh, high level gymnastics skill sets, the, the, the better you are at those, Hey, the more fitness you can express. Right. Um, which brings me to this next train of thought, Dallin, is that Boz, when it comes to programming, does it in a very unique way. And it almost seems as though, um, he really likes to pigeonhole the, like the, the community of athletes they're competing 
um, I guess you could you could say the lineup um, in regards to like these these separators that aren't always contingent upon suffering. It is like the pirouettes or the legless uh, seated rope climbs, maybe for a lot of the women, or the wall facing handstand push ups, um, or the dumbbells on Linda right versus historically and i think that this is probably where you'll go as you've come up through the sport is that I man you know to come up through your sport you needed to be really strong and you needed to be able to suffer and be crazy fit right gymnastics was there kind of right we had to be doing ring muscle ups of course we wanted to walk on our hands all this how has your perspective on training what you guys are doing there on a day-to-day how's that shifted knowing that boz is at the helm and that he he has a bit of a different flavor yeah i think the games hit all of us um uh like at least in my team, it hit us pretty hard realizing like uh, the the different approach we were going to need to take coming into this season. And at the beginning, it was pretty frustrating uh, with, I think all the athletes could agree. Every time we were going into a briefing is, it's kind of like you could hear it around. It's like, Oh, what's new (laughs) now? Like, what are we going to do? What's this new movement in this workout? Uh, I think people were pretty frustrated uh at the beginning um as things settled in i realized it was needed like it's it's pretty cool how he's doing it how boz is doing it and honestly i've had more fun training all of these different things it's broadened like my idea of strength when it comes to gymnastics and all of these different things and i've worked with a couple different coaches uh trying to figure out these new movements or new skills and I've really enjoyed all of it. And like you said, coming up in the sport when it was kind of the Dave Castro era, it was like, you got to be strong and you got to suffer. And I think I still have that, but I've broadened my capabilities through the gymnastics training and the skills and different approaches to workouts. And there's different stimuluses and there's so many more things to work on. And it's, it's been pretty enjoyable this last season uh, trying to solve those puzzle pieces. You know, I wouldn't, I wouldn't really have expected your response to be much different just because I know how you are as a competitor. Um, but I got to say, man, there's athletes out there that, that don't have the same perspective. And I say that in regards to like, hey, they might not like the, the flavor, yeah. right? They might not like the flavor that Boz brings or they think it's dumb, right? And it, it doesn't play out well in their favor when they choose that mindset. No. I'm just going to say it, right? Like publicly when people are complaining about program, like, yeah, you're going to be irrelevant very quickly. <laughs> Uh, because of the fact that like, okay, clearly, you know, there's a weakness exposure. There's something about this that you don't like, and you're not willing to adapt and change or see the bigger picture. Um, so I appreciate that, that you're honest. You're like, Hey, much, but now I have a understanding of kind of the idea behind it, where it's going. And I accept it. The one thing that you mentioned that I actually love about all this, because I I've told many people and I'll probably be saying it for a while, to be honest, I'm like, yo, Boz has made my job really hard. Um, and I say that from a perspective of a coach as an athlete, and even as sometimes an analyst of the sport, because it's shifted and evolved so much. I think in his mind, he's correcting it in regards to like moving it towards the middle of what pure fitness really is versus just us out toughing each other. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, but I, I, you know, the thing that you mentioned that really stood out was that you're having fun and, for me, when I look at where the tests have been and the things that are exposed and the things now that we've got to focus on a touch more, I'm like, I think this might actually do something for your durability and longevity in the sport. Because it's like, hey, yeah, we, we still clean and jerk. We still snatch. Of course, hey, we, we know the 100. Fitness in 100 words. If you're a competitor or coach in the space, you should be familiar with what that is because that's really the origin of everything. CrossFit, particularly our sport. So we're going to keep snatching, clean and jerk, doing all the strength. We're going to do all the intervals. We're going to do all that. But now there's a little bit more attention to the pirouettes and the handstand hold and the L-sit and all these different things. So I know you said it's fun, which is great. Tell me a little bit what, how, how you've been trying to manage those new skill sets with your previous style of training and, and blending that together. You said you worked with a couple new coaches. What's, what's that been like for you? Yeah, I think my approach towards it with all of the new stuff, a lot of it is – so going back to the games again. Yep. And going back to what you said about athletes like complaining, if you would have interviewed me during the games or a week after the games, I would have been that athlete for sure. Uh, I was super frustrated. The new movements were exposing weaknesses I already had in an even bigger way. So it was magnified. Um, So many things. And so with all of the new skills, 
you got to really pick and choose what you're completely focused on. And you got to bring those baselines up to the next one, reanalyze, look at where you have holes, bring those up. Uh, and so maybe, maybe I'm not snatching for like a whole six week cycle. Maybe I'm not, maybe it's, you're touching on it once every two weeks. Uh, I'm pretty good at snatching relative to the field uh, compared to other areas. So it is kind of a game of like, what are you going to choose to prioritize? You only have so much energy. Uh, you can't overtrain. So there's almost for a lot of the season, especially the off season, there's no point in doing the things you're already good at. And people love to do the things they're good at every single day. It's, it's easy. That's, that's easy. So I think that's the most important thing is like really hammering weaknesses and being analytical in the way you train and what you're choosing to do and spend your time. Man, you said something right there that I think is extremely hard, not just for, not just for experienced athletes, but for new athletes too. And you said, yo, maybe I'm not really snatching and focus on the snatch for six weeks. Bro, you know how many people would lose their absolute mind? <laughs> if they I do it too. It. I just have yeah. to Listen. talk myself off a cliff. Yeah. Exactly. And that's kind of where I'm going with this. But if people aren't snatching twice a week, they're like, coach, what's going on? My snatch is going to go down. It's going to be terrible. Like, I need this work. I need to do this. I need to refine these. Listen, and, and you know, as a coach, it's just like, hey, pump your brakes. I understand where your insecurities might lie about us not touching this frequently, but there are some priorities we got to take care of. And a snatch ain't one of them, if that's the, the route that we're choosing to work on, right? So how do you navigate that? Because equally, I know as a competitor, you want to win. You, you have you have audacious goals within this space, my man, and I'm more than aware of that. So I know what your work ethic looks like and your commitment to the process that way. How do you trust when you're like, having these conversations with Matt or the rest of the team there that's kind of help navigate your training season. And, and they're like, yeah, next six to eight weeks, bro, we'll, we'll, we'll touch the snatch once a week. This will be the percentage work. And you're like, wait, what? Once a week like that? Nah, come on, man. You got to be more than that. Like, how do you, what's a conversation like? And then how do you deal with that without creating other insecurities about maybe something that you are naturally good at? Yeah, I think luckily I've been with Matt since I was 16. So it's been like six, whatever years now. Um, uh, so I'm pretty used to his style of programming and we're both very much on the same page with how we want to approach things. Uh, if you listen to anyone that's won over and over and over again, all they talk about is hammering weaknesses. So I think naturally, naturally, like that's what I want to work on because I know that's what's going to make me better. Um, and I've seen it work with Matt and I having only snatched like, 70% is the number we're touching on. It's just maintenance work, that type of thing. And then come competition time, I know it's ready. A great example of that is the final at the semis this year. Like that was, that was a sick workout. It was fun. I won. It was awesome. The last time I've done echo bike sprints at that stimulus, I don't know. Like I know I have it in the back pocket. And then in comparison to that would be like the, the ruck workout with all the gymnastics movements. I got fourth I think on that one and that's probably my biggest mistake was inside that workout and I think I had a shot at going for a win mm -hmm. uh, in a small guy workout kind of thing yeah so I think that's the that's a great reminder of like I just gotta keep doing what I'm doing the other stuff will be there when I need it to be as long as we're touching on it every once in a while um, and I think it takes time to develop the confidence in the program and trusting yourself and learning that that is possible to do. Like you can save things. Yeah, man, you're, 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 you're spitting fire here. You know, you're teaching everybody. If, if athletes are out there listening to this, I hope they're taking notes, especially those that are coming up through the space. Um, that was a common pitfall for me as an athlete. Right. And I'm very honest with this about the people that I work with now. Um, and even the other people that I get to mentor in any way in the space is that I really believed that if I didn't touch something, people were certainly going to pass me up, man. Like there was no way, no way getting around it. And what that came down to were the number of insecurities that I had about training versus competing. And what I thought was that I always had to experience what I was going to do competition wise in my training all the time. And in fact, it was too often. This led to me being kind of run down, burn out and really right there, always toned the line with like injury and overuse. What you just said is so important and so valuable for many people to understand that like the, the echo bike is a strength of yours. You dismissed it for weeks. Yet, 
because you know in your mind you trust the process, right? Which, again, folks, this ain't like he, he wasn't born with this ability. <laughs> Dallin, I know you're an old soul, but you weren't born with this ability, right? Like you learned this, <laughs> no. you learned this over time to trust this process. But you put on a clinic with the pacing of that bike. And, and I couldn't tell you, I don't know what your RPMs were. I don't know what your watts were. But I noticed intentionally a couple things. One, I love the way that you cycle toes to bar. It's a beautiful thing. Pretty tight in regards to the turnaround. Not undue effort in regards to, hey, I'm trying to kick as fast as I can. No, no. None of that, but no wasted movement. And the cycle rate in itself was something I paid attention to out, out of round one. And then I was like, hey, watch Pepper. You know, I don't remember what lane you were in. But you yeah. didn't lead in the first round or two, right? You didn't. But over time, the, the, the drastic and dramatic kip and redirection of change of the body where the head was coming through the window and the athletes were coming back through, you didn't have all that. Your body was a bit more stationary or stalemated and you were using your strong hip flexors and your abs to pull that up. So nonetheless, folks, don't be jealous of that. He's built it over time. And on the bike, though, it seemed as though you were almost able to negative split the, the bikes and, and and it might not be a hundred percent true your first might have been a little faster than your third or your second but it was close versus the rest of the field man they came out hot were just a little less hot and even though they were digging were probably just a little less hot other than hopper you and him were both kind of there hand in hand with the with the exchanges there on that on that bike um but man in your mind not touching that for a while right and i'm here you know not blowing smoke up your butt, but just kind of giving you your kudos on the way that you executed this. Did you have confidence that you could go in there and do it exactly the way that you did it? Or was it more of like, this is how I need to feel in round one. This is how I need to feel in round two. And in round three, were there numbers and data on that bike that you knew for sure you needed to stick? Yeah, I was definitely faster than when I practiced it. Um, it was kind of a Hail Mary situation because it was like, if I beat Roman in this workout, I'm going to podium. Yep. If I completely blow up, I'll take fifth, and no one's going to remember the difference between fourth and fifth. So it's like, who cares? Um, so I definitely went faster than in training, not necessarily on purpose. It just kind of happened by the time I finished the 15 cows. Um, and I was like, I feel fine. Got on the second bike. I knew a number I needed to hold. Still felt fine, and then I was able to turn it on for the third round. Um, and the definitely the adrenaline of being on the floor, you could hear the crowd and the setup of the workout was so cool where yeah. like Roman was off the first bike by the time I hit nine calories. And I was like, oh man, he went for it. He hammered that bike. And then by the time we finished the 20 toes to bar, he only got off three reps before me. So I was like, oh, cycle speed here. Like you mentioned, yep. is like, we're closing the gap a little bit. And then as we're running across the floor with these bags, and that's where you can kind of see where people are, how fast they're moving the bag and goes back to the gaming. And yeah, like going into it, it was, I had numbers in mind, but then it turned into how I felt and just trusting my body and just holding on for dear life. <laughs> yeah. You mentioned this was one of the, you were deciding if the juice was, and in this instance, it was completely because you were aware where you were where you wanted to end up, and then what also was going to be the negative effects of it, right? And you were like, cool, fourth and fifth, irrelevant to me. Um, third, really want that. Let's go get that. How do I do that? So I think that's that's also another lesson in itself is also being able to kind of scale when, when the risk is worth it and how to go about that. Um, yeah, man, well done on that. We, I think I was, I was listening to a podcast the other day. Um, it might've been get with the programming. I think it was, those guys were talking about that final event. And I was like, yeah, if you want to, if you go back and watch, you can, you can watch Dallin Pepper put on a clinic on how to execute pacing appropriately with kind of where your limiters are. You know what I mean? Like you, you sent it in the right way where, Hey, you, you, you fit, you crossed the finish line and was like, yeah, there probably wasn't many more toes bar left in there. Um, <laughs> after that, yeah. and, and you probably didn't want any more than the 45 calories on the bike. Um, but you, but you nailed it, man. Now, Here's where my mind goes in regards to your pacing ability, your execution at semis is looking forward onto the CrossFit Games 2023, man. You're down there in Naples. You got uh, Daniel Brandon. You got Emma Carey. You got James Sprague. You got Fisa Gaffey. Uh, might be leaving out some others. But nope, I'm, you got that, it. that's the squad of you guys that are, that are moving onward uh, throughout the season. And now you guys are out there. Um, I'd imagine you're getting outside a bit more. You're getting to the field. You're doing the – Man, you're doing the, the funnest stuff that exists mm -hmm. in our sport, right? Like what a blessing it is to 
be one of the 40, in this case, one of the 80, we consider the men and women, um, with a really strong why in behind your training. Because there's other people still training, man, but guess what? They're looking to 2024 already. Um, so you guys are in this fortunate situation. What's training look like for you now in these in this next uh, seven to eight weeks? Yeah, it's been cool. It's been cool because we did start some of the field work a little early. It's just running. Um, we started a little before semifinals with the progression written out for the games. Uh, so to continue and build on top of that, where we start taking odd objects, where where this base we built before semis, and now we get to add more of a game style to it. Um, like you said, it's the funnest time of the year for sure. We get to start. We're gonna start road biking, all of that stuff, open water swims, pool swims with machines and dumbbells. Like we're just trying to collect as much data as possible. You're trying to put together as many movement combinations as you can that still has that weakness emphasis where you like i have the data markers like on the echo bike like you said um so i'm not gonna be doing as much of that stuff but trying to create these combinations to be able to draw back on when we get an event announced it's like how should we approach this based on how this went um yeah it's so exciting and like getting to brainstorm with matt about what we're gonna do um and how we're gonna build on top of it is a blast oh man that's that's it literally is the most fun um for people that have yet to experience getting ready for the crossfit games one day if you make it it's it's the most amazing experience those those eight weeks building up to it um but you're also down there with a crew right a very competitive crew also athletes that um man some of them are going back to the games for the first time in a while james has punched his first ticket as an individual you and Danielle, Danielle, multiple times going back. You, you now into your second year. What's it like being surrounded by them um, in this in this moment in time in your career? I think it's uh, it's almost vital, like to have that type of energy. We can pull from each other. Like one example is getting back into it right after semis. After our time off, we had a pretty big pool workout. And it was a little bit daunting when you're just looking at it on your phone. It's like, okay, coach. Um, <laughs> and like, I was like pretty anxious going into it. Show up, whole squad rolls in. And it's like, all right, we got this. Like, let's get after it. Uh, things as little as that. Like, even if they're feeling the exact same way as me, like no one's going to show it. Like we might have the conversation, but it's like, sure, we're not going to let anyone just lollygag around and, uh, we're making sure we're pushing each other every single day. Like Danielle and I were doing some C2 intervals the other day and finished with like a 600. It's like just full send on that last one. And it's like, she saw me standing through the whole interval. So she flipped her damper up. She was standing and we're like, it's like we're talking crap and I don't know. There's there's so much push with the trash talk, but also like we're all very supportive of one another and want each other to succeed and do the best we can. It's a blast. Yeah, it's great, man. And I, and I think that's an important part of it too. It's just you have to continue to find ways to make it fun, right? Mm -hmm. it, it's very serious. Everybody's taking it serious that is competing at the semifinal level, um, whether they're full, working full time and have a career or or what, or they're a full time athlete. Um, everyone that makes the semifinals alone takes training very seriously. But there has to be this unique balance of life, fun, play in your training, um, the camaraderie that exists. I can, I can take myself back to uh, the training for the games in 2015. I wasn't surrounded by a team necessarily. But what I did have at Wasatch CrossFit was I had like a handful of people that almost no matter what time I was training, there was going to be about – one to three of them that were showing up. It could have been 7 a.m. before I coach. Boom, they're there with me. It could be 2 p.m. at the track to get in like some hot sun exposure, but under, you know, outside running type stuff. Boom, there's another three to four, sometimes five people with me. Could be a late p.m. session after I coach at 6.30 or 7 p.m. Bam, there's another few. So I completely understand the value of community. And I always think that that's one thing that lacks for those that train by themselves all the time. Um, how often are you in the gym completely alone? Is that ever something that, that you do at this point in your career at all? Uh, so we actually moved January so I could have a garage gym. We found a little townhome uh, like specifically for 
the ability to have a garage gym so that when I feel like I needed that, I could just head down there by myself. Um, very rarely am I training alone right now, though. And I think you brought up a great point where you said training alone all the time. And I think there's so much value to training alone. And I, this is just, again, this is my opinion, but I think there is value to like earning that time with training partners. Like you got to go through it alone. You got to figure out what you're about. You got to figure out your why. And then you can start to carry that over when you start training with people more and more and more. And as a teen, I did a lot of that training alone and I loved it. Um, But it does start to wear on you a little bit. And so creating that balance. Maybe it's a couple of days a week here or one or two days a week where you are training alone um, or based on the time of year. Like we know athletes yep. are traveling all over that type of thing. Um, I think there's tons of value to both. And so that's, and I just thought it was interesting that you touched on that. Yeah. And, and I agree with you. I think it is a fine balance, man. There's many, a uh, some of my best memories is training alone and some of my greatest achievements even, you know what I mean? It's just me and the, me and the camera. Right. Like it was, Mm -hmm. it was just that type of experience that, that, that brought, um, some of my most referred to memories when I'm competing. And what I say, what I, what I mean by that is like, there's a time when you're standing on the floor, when you hear that announcer say, stand by, and it's like this moment, right. And it's, it's the, man, it gives me goosebumps just thinking about it, but the silence that exists within this large group of people in stadium or outdoor arena, wherever we're at. And it's like, you almost get like this sped up cycle. I do in my mind. It's like a flashback to like all these experiences that I've gotten when I was trained alone, those grinding times, like those are what stand out to me most where it's like, yeah, man, you know, we earned this opportunity to be here. And it's just a reminder of like, I belong. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, not that you don't get that training with people. Cause you do, but it's just affirmation of like, yo, I'll put this work and, uh, you know, something that I'd always say in my mind, somebody's going to feel this fitness, right? Like that'd be <laughs> somebody going to feel this fitness today. Um, man. So you, you know, a little backstory on you and I don't know, and I'm, I'm sure I'll get to this in the intro. So people have already have been aware of it, but you're 21 years old. You've been in this space for a long time, man. You're a vet, even though you're so young in your years, um, you are what I would categorize an old soul for sure. Right. Absolutely. But you're a games champ many times over from the team division or the team division, excuse me, um, three times. And you've been training at a very high level for so long, Dallin. And we see this now in our space. We see it with Mal O'Brien. We see it with Haley Adams. We see it with Emma Carey. We see it like there are several names, uh, Emma Lawson, that stand out to me naturally where I'm like, OK, even Guy to a degree. You know, you guys going head to head back in the day. Um you know, before, before it was the individual style competition, how have you been able to balance, um, your, your personal desire to compete, um, to keep the fire burning, not just hot, but hotter almost each year, it seems, um, knowing that there's so many internal pressures, whether it's sponsorship, whether it's social media, whether it's whatever it is, how, how do you feel like you've balanced your life and this career that you've chosen for yourself? Yeah. So I think, over the last year or so, like since I've come to Florida, I feel like I've understood what balance actually means and understanding that there's different balance. Um, there's daily balance. I look at it as like a yearly or season balance and then balance throughout my life. Um, so each day trying to find something that does pull me away from CrossFit, from training, from recovery, even for a short amount of time, whether it's walking with Korean and our dog, like just little things. Um, sometimes I'm not great at that. Sometimes I can get pretty consumed by what's happening every single day. Um, so that, that one probably is the one I work on the most, uh, trying to perfect that and I never will, but I'll continue to try. And then when it comes to a season and yearly balance, I think we see more and more and more people are truly taking actual off seasons. And I think that's so important. We need the time off. Um, kind of be a regular person for a minute, whether it's a month or two or however long, whatever works for you. And then a life balance where it's like throughout your whole life, I know that my time in the sport is going to end and I know it's not that long in the grand scheme of things. So I'm going to give everything I can while I have it. Uh, Like I started competing when I was 15, probably got 15, 16 years in me. Uh, Like I'm I'm here to grind for those years and then uh, reap the benefits of it when I'm done. So I think that's how I started to view balance and it's going to be different and people might disagree with 
what my daily balance looks like. And I know people will, but when you are trying to be the best in the world at something, that balance daily doesn't exist the way other people might see it. Yeah. And, you know, shout out to your wife, Corinne, for supporting the journey and, and being the, <laughs> being, being your right hand in all this pursuit. Um, you, you know, you share this again from a pretty mature perspective, man, as like you live a, what I'll categorize as quote unquote, an adult life, right? Like not that, not that a lot of people don't, I'm not saying that about others, but I'm saying that, Hey, you, you do have a spouse and, and you are mindful of family and time with her and balancing this, that, and the other, which many people do, but it seems as though, uh, you know, and you mentioned that moving to Naples helped open your eyes to this, um, that having other responsibilities has been actually a healthy part of your mm -hmm. journey. Um, when you were a teen though, and you didn't have these other responsibilities or these commitments, were there ever times where you felt like you were too deep into this? Like it consumed too much of your life? In the moment? No, it's interesting as a teen. I like I think back on those years a lot and like, uh, in ways I'm trying to chase exactly what I had as a teen where there was nothing else. It was crazy. It was like this, this crazy feeling. And like, um, it was cool. Like I am trying to like put myself in those moments in training. Um, but there definitely was like a time where you get into it pretty deep because all you have is school. And like, I was, I did well in school. So like sometimes I was only part-time in school because I didn't have to be there all day. And it's like, I'm training, training, training alone. Um, and like obsessing over this goal and where we're still growing and not fully understanding those things. Like I could have never told you what I just did about balance right. four years ago. Like there's no, there's no chance. Like I didn't have that perspective and I didn't, I didn't have like, I'm still young, but like those years come and you learn and you learn. Um, but there was a time I feel like when I, when I think about like the life balance and stuff, balancing what's happening in my life compared to CrossFit and that type of thing, it was around COVID when everything hit and there was no competitions. It was, mm -hmm. that was after my last year as a team. Um, I was really trying to figure out what I was going to do with my life because there was no, the whole world shut down. Um, and I think that was kind of like, I don't ever want to compare like to like, I don't know Haley's situation fully. I don't know Mal's, any of that, but like sure. I had my time where I like, I don't know if I want to do this. Yep. Um, and so trying to figure out exactly why I was doing it, that type of thing. And then another moment a little earlier on in 2019. So just before COVID, I remember is still snow on the ground, uh, but the football field was kind of dry. And all my buddies that I grew up playing baseball were out getting their arms ready for the season, playing some long toss. And I was driving home. And I, I just remember very vividly, like, looking out at the field at all my buddies. And I was like, oh, man, I kind of missed that. And then that day, I actually decided I was going to go play that season. Nice. So my junior yeah. year, I played baseball. Senior year, I played football. And I think that could have been – that was the best decision I could have made. Um, and yeah, did I, did I train less? Absolutely. Yeah. Um, I was, I was doing other things. Um, but for long term, that was probably one of the best things I could have done for myself in CrossFit. And it was actually just less CrossFit for a minute when I was young. Um, so like, that was kind of like out of order all over the place. But oh, man, yeah. That's kind of what I learned as a teen. And, um, I think. I think every teen kind of goes through that and like making that transition from team to individual is stupid hard. And that was the 2019, 2020, 2021 years um, where I was really trying to figure out what I was going to do. So, but with the team behind me, I was able to figure out like some of those things and what I wanted and the support and all of that. And so having a good team and trying to continue to learn perspective every single day. All right, man, you've mentioned your, your team several times within this interview, you know, people that have supported your journey and it'd be, it'd be remiss of me not to bring up your family. Um, yeah. you know, because I know that they had a, a very strong part in you finding CrossFit and getting into this journey that you've chosen, uh, from day one. So tell me a little bit about, uh, you know, your folks, I know they're here in Utah. Um, you've got some siblings, like get, give everybody the, the update on the, on the pepper clan. Yeah. I mean, they're all playing basically every single sport I couldn't even keep track of between all of them, like everything that they're doing, whether it's 
tumbling soccer, volleyball, softball, baseball. They got everything going on, so they're nice and busy. But uh, and how yeah, many I siblings mean, do you have? I got four siblings, all younger. So yeah, um, all about two or three years between each of us. And um, yeah, I mean, they're as crazy as ever. They're getting old when I go back. Like my youngest sister, like <laughs> it's crazy what six months will do with the age she's at and like um uh, it's cool to see them and it's it's been cool because they'll like my brother's gotten like he's been grinding with baseball and just like he's asking for like i don't want to say like mental toughness books but like those type of books like david yeah. goggins type stuff and he's always asking like uh my advice for stuff like that and it's been really cool to share like what i've learned with them now that they're starting to grow up and like they're really trying to work hard and it's fun to see that's awesome man um and 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 tell us a little bit about your your crossfit origin story like how what's the first time you walked into a gym why'd you beat why were you there like what was that experience like for you yeah um so my uncle my mom's brother was actually he'd been doing crossfit for a bit and he finally got my dad to go this was long before i started um my mom started going and is in the mornings and with all the kids going to school, they, they're like, all right, we can't drive 20 minutes to a box. Um, we're just going to get some garage gym stuff. Cause we have a little detached garage back home. And so they started doing workouts every morning out there, just following dot com or the, the gym posted their workouts and forever. It was always like, Hey, you should come work out. It'll help you with baseball, football, basketball. I was like, no, nah, that's stupid. I'm just going to keep going to practice. Like I'll work hard at practice. I'm not going to work out for fun. That sounds pretty dumb. Uh, <laughs> and it just goes on and on and on. And like, they got me out there like once or twice. And I'd like do like a max box jump and some curls, like just like nothing even close to CrossFit. And then the Froning documentary comes out. My dad's like, Hey, you should watch this. You should watch this. I was like, Oh, maybe one day, dad, maybe one day. Yep. Um, and then the 2015 CrossFit games comes and I see there's a teenage division my dad's showing me and then I watched every single event. And from that day on, I was like, I want to do that. I want to go to the CrossFit games. Um, so that year with the teenage division, like kind of showed me like, Oh, you can compete in this. Like, this is like a sport we're racing. We're trying to beat each other. Um, uh, and that's kind of where I started. That's when I got into it. And since that day in 2015, that's what I wanted to do. So I started training in the garage every single day with my dad's help. He had, done enough stuff that we could we could kind of do it and yep. then six months later i started at my first gym spanish fork crossfit um and the affiliate owner at the time coached me took me to my first games um so it was pretty fun pretty pretty interesting like seeing where i was to where i am now and like everyone has an interesting start into crossfit i feel like i i agree everybody has their own little story and it's funny that yours initially is resistance Right, like you're yeah. like, nah, man, working out for fun. That sounds stupid. I want to compete over here. I'm doing my sports. Like, leave me alone. Uh, but then you find your way out. So it's a combo of like, hey, it was a part of the family. It was a part of the family culture. You had some equipment in the garage. You see the Froning documentary. Okay, now I'm now I'm a little bit more interested. But then the icing on the cake was, wait, I can do this as a teen. Mm -hmm. um and then you were like okay i want to i want to go out there and go go win that thing which of course you were able to do that's that's amazing man i think that's a really cool and and fun story i you know when i think about young athletes coming up through the space like like you it's so different than like the the way i got into it because i did see it online and i and i and i wanted to compete in it but i was already coaching right i was doing performance mm -hmm. coaching guys like yourself baseball football right speed and agility strength conditioning um uh, and immediately as I, as I started dabbling in CrossFit myself, I was like, cool, I'm coaching this stuff. Do you ever have that in your mind? Like, Hey, you know, when you, when your career and, and your, your focus on yourself is done, do you, do you ever want to coach? Do you ever want to be involved in more, more ways than just the competitive side of the space? I think like originally it was like, Oh, I want to open up a gym. I don't know okay. if I necessarily know if I want to go that route. Uh, maybe I'd like to have a gym. I don't think I'd like to, like the day-to-day -day type of stuff, I don't think would be where I'd want to do it. I think, honestly, I think what Frazier's done is pretty cool. Like he's built his brand. Uh, he's opened that gym specifically for games athletes to come and train. He's helping games athletes. Uh, like what Matt's doing with Brute. Um, both of them are doing things a little bit different, obviously. Uh, yeah. 
but I think it'd be cool to like, as I continue to progress and gain knowledge of the sports, turn around and share it with the next people. I think that's, I, I watched some David Goggins click clip just the other day that came up and uh, it's like becoming the best in the world and obsessing over this goal and then turning around and giving it to the next person. So I think that's a cool idea. Yeah. And I think there would be great fulfillment that you would feel from getting that opportunity, you know, yeah. um, gosh, man, if you packed it up today and we're like, yo, I'm done with this thing, your resume speaks for itself. And as well as your experiences, right. You've got a, you got a, you got a lot of experiences under your belt, um, you know, with, with all the years of training. So there's definitely some jewels there that you'll be able to pass down to the next generation when you decide that it is time. Uh, but man, I've appreciated your time on this interview. I could chat with you for hours cause we could geek out and nerd out about stories and or training and, <laughs> or who knows what, um, but Dallin, there's, there's five final questions that I ask everybody on the show just to, uh, kind of show some different sides of either their personality and, or their interests. But the first question that I got for you as we wind this thing down is what it was your most memorable open workout and why? Most memorable open workout was 17.3 is the okay. chipper of pull-ups and squat snatch. I think I just had pull-ups when I was 15. I think it was chest yep. to bar. Yes, sir. Uh, I PR'd my snatch twice at 205. Um, it was like a 15-pound PR. I didn't quite finish the workout, but I tied worldwide on that one. And I just remember, like, I didn't know what to do. I just, like, kind of started tearing up because I just smoked these 205 snatches. Uh, yeah. And the gym was packed, like, easily my favorite open workout. That's so cool. Yeah, that's and, and those uh, those are the reasons we sign up for the open, right? whether you're pursuing the CrossFit games or not, um, the everyday athlete has the same experiences. Actually, even more than I would say us competitive athletes do because the way they train and the way that they can progress is still so very different mm -hmm. that, like, you see people smoking PRs all the time. You're like, bro, you just did that five times? They're like, yeah, and it's actually 10 pounds over my PR. It's, it's like, wow. <laughs> yeah. like, those those stories are, are really what fire us up, people getting their first muscle up. So I appreciate you sharing that uh, and how important that probably was in, in your journey because, again, those moments are the ones that are remind reminding us that what we're doing is working and we're trending in the right direction. Or for you, it was a, it was a stark, like, uh, probably a very conclusive moment where it was like, yo, I can compete with the best in the world now. Like this is it. I'm tied to be the worldwide leader in something. And I PR would as I did it. Like there was pressure involved, man. No wonder you teared up, man. That's a, that's a magical <laughs> moment in athletes experience. I believe it. Yes, sir. Okay. Number two, um, overall so now this isn't just about the open what's your most memorable competition memory like an experience uh i think it came each year like after the competition as a team um we were i never competed in the coliseum as a team mm. but we always did the award ceremony we'd always go out for the individual and teams award ceremony Yep. Um, and specifically that first year after I had won, um, came out, you were, you were standing on top of the podium that year. Uh, That's right. It was a good, that was a good year. My man. <laughs> uh, and just like being on that Coliseum floor and the picture of myself out there one day and then just come and make it happen a few years later. Like those kind of moments always stick out in my brain. Mm. I love that. That was, that was like your imprint. You know what I'm saying? Like it was, it was like, yo, this is where I want to be. Um, not mm -hmm. to mention it's, it's kind of cool that your career has been adjacent with Madison uh, mm -hmm. for the most part, right? Like, of course you got your spark and your fire by watching the teens throw down at the home Depot center there in LA. But then, you know, since, since you've been there and present, it's, it's been rolling through Madison. So it, it's really cool that your first year was there and it's, it's kind of been, the staple location. I, I definitely love that place. I don't know where we're going in the future, bro. I don't yeah, know where we're going to end up, but um, I, I certainly have loved, loved the experiences that we've built in Madison there. Um, number three, what is most likely playing over the speakers in those ESC headphones that you got while you're training or while you're throwing down? If you're, if you're in control. Oh man. Uh, it bounces between like country and rap, like all day at the gym. <laughs> uh, and like, that's kind of like everyone's, everyone on their country or rap. So. Okay. Yeah. I like that. So, so you got to describe this to me though, because I know you guys don't always train together. And I know sometimes it's different folks in and out of the gym when you're there, probably. How do you decide who gets to have control of the speakers at the main location? 
Uh, whoever's lifting the heaviest or whoever has the hardest workout. <laughs> oh, okay. That's, that's yeah. fair. I like that. I it's like kind of like we all look at each other's program and it's like, all right, yeah, you can, you can choose the music. You're going through it today. But okay. That's how it works. I get it. All right. I, I, I was very curious. I thought maybe Danielle would flex her seniority and or games finishes and be like, yo, y'all don't got nothing to say on me. I'm picking the music. I've been yeah, around the longest. I've been around the longest. <laughs> okay. All right. So, see, so you got some arguments there. Okay. I like it. I think that I think you guys got a good thing going. You know, hey, who's slinging the heaviest weight or who got the most nasty uh, conditioning piece that gets to, gets to have control? That makes sense. Um, question four is a bit more reflective. Uh, what type of impact would you hope to leave on the CrossFit space, man, overall? Oh, man. I think something like – I've always thought about, and I always, I always get asked the questions like, if there's anything you could uh, say for the teenagers that might be listening, like that was kind of a question that was pretty common on podcasts. It was always like, if you set your mind to something, you can make it happen as long as you're willing to work for it. Mm. And I think some sort of embodiment of work ethic and continuing to be a good human and growing as an athlete and a person something along those lines. I'll continue to figure that out as I go down the road, but that's yes. kind of what I want to stand for. Oh man. I think that's, that's amazing. And I think that you're, uh, you know, you're, you're building that as you go and kind of creating that, that, that lesson, um, throughout your years, even as you kind of live them out here, which is, which is powerful. Um, last question, which is pretty, uh, a pretty great one for you with your family's involvement and their influence, even in your life. But there's a lot of people that are watching you throughout your career. They've watched me. They, they, they hear about what CrossFit is. They see the videos, but they're out there and they're very insecure about stepping into a CrossFit gym, man. They, they don't know that being an affiliate or being a member is for them. They don't know if they're fit enough. Um, they don't know if, if they'll fit in. Right. Uh, what would you say to people to encourage them to, to join a gym or to give this, this thing that we love a try? Uh, I think I think CrossFit's actually been pushing this, but like you don't need to be fit to go to CrossFit gym for the first time. Uh, I know that I have seen like the magic of CrossFit, the spirit of CrossFit, and affiliates all over the place. People who are terrified to walk in for the first time. And that's totally okay. I was scared and like I had no idea what I was doing. Um, Same here. Yeah, it's like it's crazy, but I know that once you like get in there, not only is it going to be great for your health, uh, like your mental, um, but also like a social aspect. I think you're going to meet some of your best friends inside that gym. There's, there isn't anything that grows people closer than suffering through a workout together and doing the same thing, whether that's me on the floor with my competitors, that kind of just, you have this bond that no one can really break. Even if, even if you don't really like them, I'm just kidding. Uh, but, uh, <laughs> Like when you're in an affiliate doing a class with the people around you, you become very close, and I think it's something special. Yeah, man, I agree, and I think that's a great answer to it, man. It it helps depict again, you know, what the the, the title of, the title of the the show in itself, man, is more than fitness, and we know that CrossFit is more than that. Although it it has a pretty unique ability to to make some pretty fit humans. Um, you're you're one of them yourselves, but I think you know you 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 summed it up very great there. Uh, saying that, that psychologically and relationally are two of the things that a lot of people uh, never really anticipate changing. And, and, and you become a different human, honestly, right? The amount of humility um, that it takes to get started and then the amount of confidence that it builds in you, in you and the things that you can do uh, because you prove it to yourself almost on a daily basis in a CrossFit gym, man, because it's, it's always an experience to say the least. Well, Dallin, um, I've loved this time, man. I don't want to monopolize too much of your is it a fake rest day for you, man? Are you uh, are you an active rest guy? Are you? Yeah, it's one of those fake rest days. Full okay. rest day Sunday, yeah. Yeah, man, I get it. Fake rest day. Uh, Alex Gazan, shout out to Alex Gazan, who I had on <laughs> a, a while. Look back, she was like, yeah, it's a fake rest day. And I was like, okay, no, I like the, I like the vibe of that. She's like, I yeah. Like that. Yeah, she's because you know she was swimming and doing the erg, and so it was it was it was a really funny way. And I was like, I think I, I think I'll let that stick around. But enjoy the rest of your fake rest day, man. I appreciate you um, taking the time to hop on here with me. We'll definitely do it again in the future. And um, you know, I I got my official call out to Madison to to cover the the event this summer. So I'll see you out there for sure. Um, hopefully, we get to see each other. If not, I'm sure I'll run into the Pepper Clan out there somewhere. I feel like Hard I always run. I always run into your dad somewhere, man, or, or we're going back and forth on social media throughout the event, at least at some point. So I always yep. look forward to that. But good luck to you, man. 
um, you know, stay happy and stay healthy out there in Naples as you prepare for another opportunity to go out there and uh, stake your claim in the space. Um, is there anything that you want to keep us in the loop of? Anything that our listeners or viewers can like watch for? Where can they follow you? Yeah, just Dallin Pepper on Instagram. Uh, that's where most of my social media is. And I'd say continue to follow the Brute Crew, uh, everything Brute Strength right now, because we got some big things coming and we got a bunch of people grinding out here. So follow all five of us at the games. It's going to be a blast. Awesome, man. Well, again, good luck to you. Thanks so much for your time, man. Audience that's tuned in and listened, this has been Dallin Pepper on another episode of More Than Fitness. We'll see you guys next time.